Yeah, you never really fail until you quit. Like, that's just the truth, right? Like, if you're really struggling right now and things aren't going your way, you haven't failed. You're only going to fail when you give up. Welcome to the Ad Valued Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we're on a mission to end entrepreneurial unhappiness. If you're an entrepreneur with a burning desire to change the world, this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform your life and business so that you can achieve the freedom and fulfillment you crave. This show is dedicated to entrepreneurs who want more out of their life, more meaning, more purpose, and ultimately, more happiness. You deserve it all, and it's possible. I'm your host, Robert Peterson, pastor turned life coach for business owners. I believe that success without happiness is not true success at all, but there's always hope for those who are willing to take action. Join us every week as we bring you inspiring leaders and messages that will help you on your journey towards success. Thank you for investing your time with us today. Let's get started. Today's guest is the owner of copywriting.org, emaildeliverability.com, and emaillistmanagement.com. His company is called Email Paramedic the leading email list management agency that has generated over $50 million for their clients since 2019 by improving email copy and deliverability. Troy Erickson was also ranked as the number 20 copywriter in the world by Peter Zemis from Traffic and Funnels. Troy is also a musician, former college baseball player, and lives in Tampa, Florida. Troy Erickson and Robert discuss bootstrapping a business from nothing to selling it how to start over in business and how to keep your business running by focusing on what you really do well. Email still works and will grow your business if you don't get distracted by shiny objects with bigger promises. Well, Troy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Just looking forward to a great conversation. Yeah, thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So typically we start each episode with the guests sharing their entrepreneurial journey and what's led them to the impact they're making in the world today. Yeah, that's a, that's a fun one for me because I never really planned on it. Um, didn't really have any entrepreneurial upbringing. I just had a, a baseball upbringing, really, and that was all I wanted to do my whole life. And me and my dad, since the age of 12 or 13, we just go out every single day and practice and obviously made it to high school. Uh, in high school, I had Tommy John surgery. I was a pitcher, Ooh. which is like not what you're supposed to have uh, in high school it's something that normally happens if you're like 30 which is like old for an athlete um so i had it there and i fought my way back and i made it to college baseball at which time i had some mental complications stemming from my surgery aka the yips which is basically a mental performance inhibitor where you have a lot of anxiety not just stemming from like surgeries and things but also just like childhood traumas and things that you don't really understand as a kid that happen in your life and they make you really anxious about other things and now as an adult i understand those things a lot better but at the time it was scary because basically i i couldn't perform because i could no longer throw a baseball accurately i would throw it over people's heads and bounce into the ground and it just like tears apart your identity especially because i was a college senior and i got cut um yeah that basically my identity went out the window and i didn't go outside for literally two weeks unless i was forced to and then my buddy said hey like let me get you out of here we're gonna go to the gym and like get you back to life but um fortunately for me in that time i you know started diving into like business and like following people especially on snapchat and i found upwork and i took a facebook ads course and closed a couple of clients and uh it kind of found my way into the whole Facebook ads place where I was writing ads and going in Facebook ads manager and just, you know, making a few bucks. So I didn't have to get a real job after college. So I did that. And then right after college ended, after I earned my way to you know, through like three or four K a month, basically my best client wanted to fire me. And I was like, why do you want to fire me? And I'm looking in ads manager and everything looked fine. Like the CPL was good. And they were like, nah, don't worry about it. We don't need you anymore. I said, no, you're going to tell me right now what the problem is. Because on my end, it looks good. And they said, okay, fine. Our emails aren't making any money. And you're getting us all these leads. And we just, we don't make any money off of them after you acquire them. And I said, Ooh. ah, 
let me try to fix this. You don't have to pay me anything, but I have a little bit of email experience from my other client. So let me just go and fix this. And when we're done, you can pay me again. So they said, all right, I guess we've got nothing to lose. So um, I went ahead and that summer they were making about 13K a month from email marketing. So I found that they were going to spam. They were sending maybe one email a week and the copy was not very good at all. So I went in and I fixed those things via educating myself with different like online courses and like people that I've met on Facebook um, and just going in and experimenting and having fun with it and trying to take away the pressure. And over the course of that summer, I fixed all three of those problems and I started making 51K a month via email. So it was almost a 4X and they were thrilled and they said, hey, why don't you keep doing this email thing and we'll just pay you more? So I was like, gosh, you're right. So I went to my other client and started basically doing the same thing. And then later that year, I started going to more events and I was the only person who was like really doing what I know today is email list management. So not just writing the emails, but also managing the list and solving spam problems, et cetera. So that's still what I do to this day. Um, and I have a whole team here in St. Pete, Florida that, that does this with me. And then we also have a certification program for um, for the people that want to learn it themselves rather than done for you. So it's pretty much how I got into this whole space. Nice. Um, well, I want to dig into the the identity thing because I think that's, that's an important challenge for um, – many entrepreneurs and many even people in jobs right their identity gets labeled as lawyer or doctor or dentist or even mom <laughs> dad yeah right and then and then that goes away um and and they get lost so so let's dig into this this identity journey obviously i mean you got lost because of the surgery and then when you couldn't play baseball anymore get cut from the team let's talk about the impact that that had on your mindset and and now looking back on on it how that's helped you you know in in having the mindset of an entrepreneur yeah i'm glad you bring this up because you know i tell my story a lot but i really really enjoy talking about this in specific and not a lot of people ask about it but it's like the most important thing um because i think that like, like there's so many things that happen to you when you're a kid that you don't even realize are affecting you on a subconscious level. Even if you're like, even if you're a senior citizen, there are things from when you were seven that are affecting you to this day. You just don't realize it. It could be like maybe you were five and you ran out in the middle of the street and almost got hit by a car and your parents stopped you and said, don't ever do that again. And there are certain things that you're afraid to do to this day because of that moment. It's just one very random example. Um, for me, a lot of it was just like I was the only child. My mom was very shy. And my dad is like, when it came to baseball, he was a perfectionist. And then I also had elements of like, I grew up, you know, very Catholic and there was like very strict rules there. So there were certain things that I just didn't really believe that I had the right to shine in. And over the course of time, it's like, I came to play baseball and like, all I ever want to do is be like really, really, really good. And anytime I had a setback, it's like, this is only temporary. I can't, like, I can't make excuses. I have to keep going. And I would just literally be so hard on myself anytime I made a mistake, which is good in one way because it makes you successful. And I was successful to an extent, played division two baseball. And there was a period of time when I was good. And then it all came crashing down and there's so much pressure. And then every time that it crashes down, the pressure increases in my own head. And it's just this like spiral of madness. And um, business was different for me because I, I never had the expectation of myself to be like amazing at it. And I just took all this energy I had from failing at baseball and eventually moved it into something else that I hadn't really thought about before. And it came a heck of a lot easier because, you know, if, if you're pitching in a, in a baseball game and something goes wrong, you have... 10 to 15 seconds to think about what you're going to do on the next pitch. Um, but in business, if something goes wrong, you have like 24 hours and it just feels like an eternity. So I'm glad I had that experience, but at the same time, yeah, identity is this crazy game where you just have to realize that it's completely normal to feel like 
you've kind of lost yourself because a lot of people are like that too, whether they admit it or not. And it's completely okay. You just have to understand like, hey, here's what I really want in life, the things that I really, really enjoy. And I need to associate myself with people that I can be very honest with who are not going to be overly defensive or get offended if I tell them that I need to make a change to better myself because the right people will really care. Um, so it's just kind of scratching the surface. I mean, there, this can get really complex and I would definitely recommend like talking to somebody who deals with literally childhood trauma. And um, I know it sounds weird at first, but it's, it's very life changing when you can just dive deep. So let's dig into like the idea that you didn't have the right to shine. Yep. Um, so I think a lot of it, and I'm still a Christian today. I'm just not like Catholic. And I think as a kid, I took a lot of those things in like very, very deeply. And right. It's like a lot of Catholicism, especially is just like putting other people first and like not taking any kind of limelight for yourself. And it's like when you practice that and it gets ingrained in your head at the age of like, you know, five, six, seven, et cetera. And it happens for years. And then all of a sudden you want to shine as an athlete. It, it really kind of clashes or shine in anything really. Uh, when one thing is telling you not to do and the other thing is telling you to do it, uh, you don't realize that a lot of times, but a lot of the decisions you make are influenced by your childhood or your past. And like the two clashing, uh, like, the angel on one shoulder and the demon on the other, and you feel like the sense of guilt. And that's how a lot of people are about money too. Um, there's these things called like money blocks. And some people are familiar with that and some aren't. But a lot of times, um, like for example, there's certain contractors I'll deal with and I want to pay them. And I'm like, hey, can you send me the invoice? And they'll be like, oh, uh, I'll do it next week or I'll do it later. Or they just do silly things that don't make sense. And it, logically it's dumb. But when you think about it, it might be because when they were growing up, their parents thought that money was evil or they had a bad experience one time with somebody who was wealthy or all these crazy things. But when you realize that, that money, for example, is a resource and you can do good with it or you can do bad with it, it's up to you. When you realize that it's a neutral resource, then you can kind of reevaluate your past and think about the experiences that you've had that have basically molded the way that you think. Um, so that's just another example, but that's probably the most common one for people in general or people listening to this. Hmm, absolutely. So I like, I like how you show, notice the difference for yourself in, in being a perfectionist in baseball, but being new in business, you didn't have the same level of expectations for performance. And so you allowed yourself some grace. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have this perfectionist tendency and they don't want to ship it. They don't want to put it out there. They, they, they want to hold on. And, and of course, you know, you and I both know that's an excuse for procrastination, but I like your approach with this client that wanted to fire you. Basically give me the summer to experiment, give me the summer to try some things. And, and when you approach business, especially entrepreneurship as an experiment, there's this idea that, I'm learning from each attempt rather than I'm failing each attempt. <laughs> and, and I think that mindset is, is really important. Yeah. You never really fail until you quit. Like that's just the truth, right? Like if you're really struggling right now and things aren't going your way, you haven't failed. You're only going to fail when you give up. So I'll just put it that way. But yeah, there's like so many pieces of this, um, but that's probably the main one. And then just, yeah, experimentation and viewing the world as your playground and not waiting for permission. That's another thing that gets instilled in people's heads. Like when you go to school, you have to sit down and raise your hand to use the bathroom and wait for permission to do your homework and things like that. And it's kind of like, I get why they do it that way because you're trying to manage so many kids, but at the same time, very few people break away from that mindset and become <laughs> entrepreneurs or at least entrepreneurs who are willing to like, you know, bend the rules and just do things on their own and go find the better result for themselves or for their client and not wait for some sign that that's not going to come. Yeah, that's so good. Like, I just remember, you know, our kids are older now, but when they first come home from school and they, they raise their hands at the dinner table, <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Cause That's we're, funny. we're indoctrinating them, right? Like, 
and school really does indoctrinate people to be employees. Um, you know, you practice going to basically at nine to five and, and, and practice basically obedience throughout the day, <laughs> submission to the, the set of rules. And entrepreneurs really do break free from that in a lot of cases, but a lot of cases that I've seen in, in like, you know, uh, the cash flow quadrants, right? You're familiar with, you know, yeah. basically the number of entrepreneurs that start their own company thinking they have this great idea, thinking they're going to do something different, but really all they've done is, is bought their job and, yeah, exactly. and, and they yeah. own their job and they're still working dollars for hours and not making any difference. Yeah, hundred percent. It's just one of those things. Um, you have to figure out what level is for you. Cause some people, yeah, there's more stress that's involved when you climb into like higher level quadrants. But at the same time, you just have to like figure out a team and like how to communicate with people and all these things. And it takes time and experimentation. But yeah, at, at the early levels of entrepreneurship, it's pretty much a customized job that you give yourself. And then as you scale up, some of that goes off your back. And then your job becomes to more so think and organize things and be creative, but yeah, there's different levels to it. Well, and then recognizing that successful entrepreneurs don't just have a single stream of income. They, yep. they don't just have this, this one business that's flowing, you know, money into their, you know, they're, they're doing other things that are different than their primary business that generates revenue. And I think that's where a lot of people get, get stuck because we think of our job as, as the unique source of revenue and we're exchanging, you know, dollar uh, time for money, and and I think that expectation for the majority of people is, you know, they're working for the weekend, they're they're working for the retirement, and that's the big, that's the big dream. But for entrepreneurs who start to see the light, they can recognize that you can design the life that you want, and create a business or multiple businesses to support it. And that's one of the things that I like to encourage people. To, give me your perspective on building your dream. Yeah. So as far as the multiple streams of income, I, I somewhat agree with that. But the thing is, you have to make sure those sources aren't too different from each other at the beginning. So, um, Ooh, I like that. And for a while, I didn't think that I had multiple sources of income, but it's like I do even within my own business, right? So I started out just doing basically client work, right? So then that was in the first quadrant, trading time for money. And I started an agency. So it's you know similar, but it's a little less time that you're trading in exchange for money. And then eventually I started a certification program, which is essentially coaching, which is the same business, but technically is a different stream of income because it's different from the agency. And then I recently bought copywriting.org as well. And that's a different stream. So I have a lot of different streams in my business that are all related. So if you're starting out and you're trying to find multiple streams, that's what I would do. Like find something similar to what you're already doing. And then technically that's another stream. Now I have real estate as well, which is like a totally different stream that's on the other end of it. But my fiance manages that. So it doesn't right. really pull me away from my main focus. So I just want to make sure that like, it's clear to people that like, hey, it's not necessarily better to be doing five totally different things just to have different streams. But streams are important. It's just how you like the order in which you do them. And, you know, eventually they'll be more different, but it always helps if you have somebody to help manage. Absolutely. Well, then having streams that can support each other, like obviously the experience that you gained running your own client work, starting an agency and training people leads to the same kind of training you can offer in, in a certification, which of course leads to all the copywriting that you can put out in support of yourself, not to mention in support of your clients. Yeah, it comes with time. It's just one of those things like get really good at one thing. And even if everybody else is telling you like, hey, crypto or real estate or like whatever is the hottest thing. And like funny, you're not really hearing a lot of that right now because of imagine that. Is, but <laughs> yeah, it's like, keep that in mind. When they say that, it's because they're killing it right now because everybody's killing it when it's easy to kill it, right? So when the economy's not doing well, you just have to think like, where are those people right now? And 
just think about it that way and say, okay, just because somebody else is pushing this doesn't mean it's the way that I have to do it. Let me just get good at one thing first and close my ears to all the new shiny opportunities out there. And then once I mastered what I'm good at and come up with some similar streams, yeah, then maybe I can go explore it. Um, Cause I don't want to bash those things. Cause like some people have been very successful with them. It's just don't get distracted by too many different things at the same time. And uh, I, I think you'll be a lot better off that way. Nice. So obviously you talked a little bit about starting out in Facebook ads and now you, you know, expanded into email, email management. So for clients listening and, and, you know, wanting to market their business, wanting to, to, to generate more leads. What's, what's the process that you would use today? I guess that's the big, right. Russell and some of those others would say, you know, if I lost everything and started over, you know, this is what I do for the next 30 days. What would Troy do if he was starting over? Yeah. So for me on a, I'll, I'll give two perspectives for this, but for me on a personal level, um, I would just essentially repeat the process that I've taken right now but just taking out the things that like, for example, now I know what works really well and what didn't. When I started out, I didn't know I had to test. So if I had to start all over again, I would take the same process, but I would use everything that I learned to take out the things that I had to experiment with because I already know what works and what doesn't. So first thing I would do is I'd go on Facebook and use my reputation in the email marketing and copywriting industry to land personal clients for myself. So I had something coming in. And then once I had too many to handle, then I would, you know, hire a team. Um, and I already have like SOPs and things in place. Now, if something happened, you know, to the industry and like I couldn't do that anymore. And that's the reason why I had to start over. Then I would just kind of use the same principles, but in like a similar industry that, um, you know, I can repeat the success that I had previously. And then when I get good at that, then I would start training other people to basically kind of learn what I do. Um, and a lot of people think that's bad and it creates too much competition, but you just have to understand like there's so many potential clients out there in the world that you, it's not even possible to serve all of them. But um, that's what I would do if I had to start over. But um, yeah, in like business in general or as it relates to email, um, I guess we could talk about that too, but that's my personal take. Well, I mean, it's completely up to you what, what you'd like to share. So are you still helping clients with Facebook ads or are you primarily focused on email now? Yeah, just email. So basically um, email list management, um, I have emaillistmanagement.com. That's basically the site I put up about that. But uh, ELM, as I call it, is basically three pieces. Um, so the first piece is making sure that your deliverability is on point. So a lot of people, they'll send emails, you know, whether it's once a month or once a day, they send emails, but it's like, do you know where they're landing? Do you know that the maximum amount of people are actually opening it compared to how many actually are opening it, right? So are you landing the spam folder or the promotions tab? Because those things literally kill the amount of reach that you get because you want to be in the primary tab. So that's the first thing we fix. And a lot of people are completely unaware about that. And that's what makes us really unique is we know how to fix it and basically get more eyes on your emails without you having to do anything differently. Second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna increase your sending volume because a lot of people think that they're gonna annoy their email list if they send too many emails. But the truth is, uh, like a lot of people talk about social media and say, hey, you need to post every day. But then when it comes to email, they're like, oh, don't do that every day. And it just it doesn't make sense when people say that. It's like if your content is good, it doesn't matter if you email it, if you put it on social media, or if you attach it to a carrier pigeon and send it to somebody's house. If the content is good, people are going to like it and they're going to want to read more. So you need to increase your volume because if you take the first two tips that I just gave you and you increase the amount of people seeing each email and then you increase the amount of emails, those things multiply. And that's how you can literally like three, four or five X revenue without actually doing anything that's overly difficult, right? We will be right back after this short break. Are you an entrepreneur who started their business with purpose and passion only to lose sight of it amidst the daily grind? We understand how frustrating that can be. That's why we're offering free strategy calls to help you gain clarity on the barriers holding you back from achieving your dreams. In just 30 minutes, our experienced coaches will work with you to identify obstacles and develop strategies for overcoming them. There's no commitment or pressure, just a chance to get some assistance and clarity you need. 
scheduling is easy. Simply visit smilingcall.com and select a time that works for you. Let's jump on a call and build your business together. It's time for you to add value and achieve your full potential as an entrepreneur. Welcome back. Let's get back to more great. And then the third piece is automation, which is basically just fine tuning like a welcome sequence or like abandoned cart or um, this really cool thing called a browse abandonment that we use. And um, it just essentially follows up with people who are like hot and ready to buy, but maybe they got distracted and didn't finish. So um, deliverability, daily emails and automations. It's pretty much what we do for our clients. And um, if you have some email experience, definitely do those things yourself. Or if you don't, definitely get help because email is great too, because you don't have ad spent. It's literally just free money minus whatever you pay somebody to do it. Well, and, and building the list, right? So, so obviously these are, these are people that, that have a, have a list, a, an existing list. So what would you recommend for somebody in the process of trying to build a list? Yeah. So the first thing is to hone in your offer because at the end of the day, an offer is like the most core fundamental thing to your business. And then if you get that down, of course, the most consistent way to build your list is through advertising. Um, but you have to have a good offer for that, especially these days, given how crazy it is. But if you're just starting out and you're like, gosh, I haven't done a good job of collecting emails. Well, just hit up your customers wherever you are, like your, your audience, wherever they hang out and just build a list and say, hey, I'm launching this like new thing. Um, you know, maybe it like whatever your niche is, you just basically build some kind of freebie that shows them like three or five ways on how to do whatever it is that most people in your niche want to know how to do. Uh, so you put out a free lead magnet like that. And then you just invite those people to get it if they join your list. Um, and then the next thing I would do as well is basically like affiliate promos. So hit up your friends in the industry who are similar to you, who have an audience. And basically you can pay them, I don't know, maybe $5 per lead for every lead that they send to you. So they would send out an email to their list or they would you know, post on social media um, a link to the free opt-in or thing for sale. And you just agree to an amount per lead or per purchase that you'll pay them. Or you could even do a swap where you promote them to your audience and they promote you to their audience. And um, yeah, those are just some easy ways to get the ball rolling, especially um, the latter ones if you don't have a, a big ad budget. So let's talk about that idea of, of, of someone else's audience, right? Using, I mean, it's similar in real estate to you know other people's money, right? OPA, OPM, but OPA um, and, and making a, either a JV agreement or an affiliate agreement. Um, What's the value of of tying into somebody else's audience besides the fact that they have an audience? Yeah, it's the main thing that I like is, you know, and I've paid people up to like $15 a lead before and it gets really expensive. But in the matter of like a couple of days, I was adding like thousands of people to my list. So that's the main thing is that you can grow very, very quickly. Um, the other thing is that, you know, if you dial in your the, the thing that you're giving them when they opt in, or it's a lead magnet, whatever, if you dial it in, um, it, it's really just a good offer that's going to get a lot of opt-ins because they trust the person that's referring them to you. So if you actually know the person or you have a good offer, the trust kind of gets passed on to you when they tell their audience about you. Um, so that's why the, it's typically going to be a higher quality person than somebody who's cold and doesn't know you because that's going to take them time to get to know you. But you build a list very quickly, um, and depending on the deal you work out, it can be a lot cheaper than advertising, and uh, there's just a lot of trust involved. So those are some things that I would consider. And how does that how does that trust play out? I mean, obviously, we all talk about no like and trust, and and in this in this space now, I mean, obviously, they throw around numbers like um, seven touches before somebody will do a transaction with you or. I mean, now some people are saying like as much as 20, like they have to see your name or see your stuff um, as many as 20 times. What does the trust factor of a audience and a referral from somebody, you know, saying, hey, this is my friend Troy. He's he's offering this copywriting course. And and I think it's it's great stuff. And I you know, that person's endorsed it for their list. What's the what's the where does that move it up? on the scale 
Yeah, first off, you're 100 percent right. It definitely takes time. Like, there's some people that are ready to go and you know join and swipe their card right now, but most people are going to take more time. Um, and that's another huge benefit of email is because you're talking to them every day. You're telling them stories. You're giving them insight. And they want to know about you. They want to get to know you. Um, but yeah, when they got to know somebody that you know first, that basically means they've already been acclimated to your industry. So a lot of those initial things that people have to learn when they come into a new industry or a new niche or a new hobby, um, they, you know, it takes time. So they already took that time to learn the basics on your friends list. So then when they come over to your list, it, it's not going to take as much time as if that person was completely cold. Nice. So, so really powerful. I mean, <laughs> to, to, to understand the power of that and, and, the willingness to partner together, right? And I think, you know, there really is room for partnerships that that work. And, you know, I've had some of those folks in the marketing space, Kenneth Yu, Dennis Yu, um, Alex Berman, and, and you look at what those guys are doing and they're constantly, you know, putting their email list and saying, hey, Dennis has got this new course on Facebook ads or Alex has this new cold email manifesto book. And, and and they're all promoting each other's each other's things because they're all elevating <laughs> the email marketing game and 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 that's really it, it expands trust and it also i think helps people see credibility right yeah and the worst case scenario even if you know the majority of people who don't join your list like cuz if you think about it like right if if they send an email about you and they send it out to 10,000 people and maybe 2,000 people open it and 100, 200 people click the link and half of them opt in. So those are actually decent numbers, right? Sure. But even the people who don't opt in, they're still seeing your name. And maybe they're like, who is this person? I'm going to Google them. And they go ahead and they Google you. Or maybe they go to their favorite social media network. So maybe it's Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. And they look you up. And they kind of get to know you and eventually they might join your list. But even if they don't, they might just find you somewhere else. They might keep you at the top of their mind. It's in today's game. It really does matter with omnipresence because people can smell when you're being inauthentic or if you're making stuff up on the spot. It's just people are getting really, really smart to that kind of thing these days because the Again, like we talked about, it takes time to like learn things. Well, the internet's been around a while now, so people are starting to learn things. And sure, there's still new stuff that comes out, but you know, it's not like the 90s when you get an email from somebody that says, "Hey, I need you to wire me money." It's like, <laughs> you know, it, people can people can sense when something's not right. So, so let's dig into that a little bit because obviously, I mean, I'm in the coaching space, and you see lots of people in the coaching space that haven't necessarily had successes, but they're, you know, their profiles full of, you know, pictures with the fancy sports car or the Airbnb they stayed at for a weekend and, and took all their, did all their photo shoots. Um, let's talk about the value of authenticity in the entrepreneurial space and, and why it's okay to be yourself. Yeah. It's, it's because better. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's actually better. You're right. Cause if you think about it, like, yeah, you just don't want to talk to people in business brain, as I call it. So you want to make sure you're talking to them in human brain. So basically, if you go up to somebody on the street, what's something you're going to say so they can relate to you? So for example, let's say I'm walking down the street in, in Tampa Bay, Florida, and somebody has a Buccaneers jersey on. I'm like, oh, hey, like, did you see the game last weekend? Like, yeah, like I'm a fan too. Like Tom Brady's my favorite. So I'm going to say that, and that's going to like get their attention, right? So same thing if I tell a story on my email list about my fandom of Tom Brady and how he's like my childhood hero and all that, there are some people that will be like, oh my gosh, me too. And then there's other people who say, okay, maybe not him, but I can relate to that with a different athlete or a different sport. Or maybe somebody will say sports aren't my thing, but you know, I really look up to like Leonardo DiCaprio or whatever, you know, everybody can relate in some context. And then I write another email about like, that my audience, one random thing they know about me is that I love drawing on whiteboards because like a lot of people today, they do everything on Google Calendar and da, da, da. And it's like, yeah, I use those, but I like to be able to write things on a wall. That's what I enjoy. 
So a lot of my audience, I've never really even mentioned this to them. They just see me do it. And that's like a relatable thing for them. And they kind of like laugh at it. So those things are not manufactured. Those things are just me being me and telling the story or just living my life. And they see a whiteboard in the video or they think about like sports and Tom Brady and all that. And, and then they think of me because they're, they, we have something in common. So that's what authenticity means to me. It's not necessarily like, oh, I'm ethical and I'm better than you because of it. It's more just like, go literally be yourself. Now, sure, you can't do that 100% of the time. Like sometimes you have to talk about business and turn on your business brain. But if you go 100% business brain, you're going to lose everybody. And if you go 100% like picture of Airbnb and jet and all that stuff, then you're going to lose some people too because they just, they're not going to believe it. So you, you kind of just have to weigh the amount of time that you talk about each thing and then you're totally fine. And this is coming from somebody who has a private jet as his background on Facebook simply because it was part of my engagement day when I proposed. And I was like, you know what? Nice. This is, it, it's really funny, <clears throat> but yeah, it's like, I love being humble and authentic and all those things are great, but sometimes you know, you, you got to show the cool things that you get to do too. So it's okay to like do those things. Just but don't if do it's it a, if you time. really did it, like the fact yeah. that you really did it, that's, that's different. So you don't walk up to the guy with a Tom Brady Jersey and start spouting off the, the, the five benefits of, of email marketing. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. It's more just like when you see a person and this goes, especially at like live events. And when you meet other people, I, I, my rule is do not bring up business unless they bring it up first. So basically I go up to somebody and just like ask them where they're from. And, you know, I've done a lot of traveling, at least when, you know, in the U S by this point in my life, and I've been to most places that people say they're from. And then we talk about that. And then eventually they're like, Oh, what do you do? So then we start talking about business and it just shows that you care. And you're not just like, like, I don't like when I'm at an event and the very first question is, so what do you do? It just doesn't <laughs> That's the make worst me question feel ever. Yeah. It goes right so, back to the identity thing that we talked about earlier. So yes, we identify by our career job, what you do and instead of the, the impact you're making or, or yeah. So I love that idea. Don't bring up business until they bring it up. Now, how do you help your clients see the value in that, in email communication? Because yeah, I assume so, it's the same, um, right? I assume we don't want to just send our, our welcome email and start spewing <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because um, like the marketing industry as a whole is becoming more aware of the fact that you have to tell stories, but not everybody is fully on board with it yet. So a lot of times at the beginning, they're like, what are you doing? Like, why aren't we selling this or like pitching this or doing discounts? I'm like, yeah, there's a time and place for those. And you can send them at the right time in your sequences or you can, you know, send out two or three business emails a week and make the rest very personal. But yeah, it's just a learning curve and people are getting more used to it now and everything comes and goes in phases. So at some point in the next five to 10 years, the, this strategy will probably shift because everything lasts for a certain period of time and then there's something new that you have to adapt to. So, and like AI right now is one of those things. And the people who don't really love the game that much are gonna be eliminated by AI and the people who do love the game are going to adapt and figure out ways that AI can aid them rather than steal their job. Yep. I heard uh, Simon Squibb, and he's in England, and he basically said, you know, Microsoft laid off 10,000 people and spent <laughs> billions to get chat GPT. But guess what? Start your own company and and, and go get that money back, basically. Because <laughs> entrepreneur, he believes entrepreneurs are going to, you know, have the biggest impact that anybody can start their own company. And so those people getting left out in the cold or feeling like, you know, corporation left them out in the cold, you know, start a company, figure out how to use the AI and, and make, you know, solve a problem with it. Yeah, totally. And if you think about it, like chat GP, GPT is just one form of AI. There's like so many different kinds in different areas. And I saw a post yesterday. It was really cool from somebody who listed out like 30 different forms of AI that are actually making a big difference in the world. So I was like, wow, that's actually really cool. And when you look at that, it gives you a lot of ideas. Now, obviously, software and AI is, you know, there's a lot of obstacles to entry there. But 
um, just thinking about those things and like, or what you were doing at a previous company and just thinking about like things that were inefficient and problems that you had. It's like, that's business. Most entrepreneurs, they had the problem themselves. And then they were like, there's got to be a better way. So then they go find the better way. And that's that. And not everybody thinks that way. Cause like we talked about some people, they just, they're cool with just getting, you know, directions every day. And they just want to like hang out with their family and not be stressed or have to think, at these crazy extreme levels, but yeah, it just depends what you want to go for. For me personally, I'm somebody that just like, I don't know. I, I just fill my calendar up every day with like things I enjoy and things that are challenging and tough. And um, not everybody thinks the same way, but um, well, for me, it's like this weird, I don't know. I'm just like addicted to it. It's, I mean, it's just another tool and you, you can either embrace the tool or some people are freaking out like the AI is going to replace us. It's back to the old robots are going to replace us and machines are going to replace us. But the truth is there's always going to be humans <laughs> dictating and, and controlling and, and, and doing, letting the machine do the work. And this is just another form of a machine doing, doing some work. And um, there's there, like you said, there's, 30, 50 different ways that AI is being used already. And you can either tap into it and and use the tool or you can refuse to use the tool and get passed by by the people that are using the tool. And I certainly don't think it's going to replace any of us, not even in the marketing space, which is where it's having a huge impact. But the truth is we still need real human stories. We still need, we still need real connection from, you know, the AI story to the human story to the sales funnel. And uh, all those pieces are still going to get put together by humans. And so incorporate it, use it, add it as a tool, just like a laptop, right? Or, or even the cell phone, those things didn't exist you know, 10, 20 years ago. And, and now nobody can imagine living without them. And so it's, it's a matter of incorporating the tool, all right. I love you mentioned your fiance. Typically I ask, uh, what's your most memorable date, but you kind of planted the seeds about <laughs> your asking her to marry you. So you got to tell us a story now. Yeah. So, um, I was thinking about doing it in September, but we lived in, you know, we live in St. Pete, Florida and, um, there was a hurricane like heading our way and they, they kept like rerouting and like getting closer to us. So we actually had to pack up and it was like mandatory evacuation and I was like, I've owned this house for a year and th there hasn't been a bad hurricane year in over a hundred years. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what, am I really about to get this unlucky? And like, it was, it was, they were like, get the heck out of town. Like the government, it was wild. So we had to leave and do that on her birthday. So I was thinking like, all right, this is, this is an easy one. Actually, I'm going to say that this is your belated birthday trip. Um, so I had everything planned kind of how I wanted it. And then through a series of events, she she found out that I purchased a ring and I was like, oh, no, but um, <laughs> she didn't see it, though. She just she just knew I had it. So I was like, OK, um, I, I approached her you know, the day before I had all this stuff scheduled, a flight to go to the Bahamas and everything. I was like, hey, tomorrow we're going to go on a trip. And she like kind of thought that it might be that. But then um she's like wait a minute we start driving she's like wait a minute why are we not going to the airport I'm like don't worry about it so we pull up and literally drive onto the runway and board our stuff onto a jet and get all our bags and everything on there and she thought i was going to do it at that point that's what she said later so we had this amazing it was like a one hour flight so if, for being private it was relatively cheap but it was you know i i just wanted to do it because it was like very special so uh we landed in the bahamas just get in this car driven straight to the sandals resort and um i pretty much proposed as quickly as i could and it just co completely caught her off guard in that specific moment um, it was on the beach and it had like candles and a dinner set up and you know it's like one of those things that um you see other people do it and you're like man that would be cool to do one day and then when you're um you know lucky and fortunate enough to to have that opportunity and actually do it it just you know, it just means a lot and it meant a lot to her of course so that's how it all unfolded. Then we um, hung out in the Bahamas for a little bit and came back and then celebrated with our families. And yeah. Nice. Well, congratulations. Glad she said yes. That's always Thank a, you. A, yeah. good, a good ending. And uh, I, I assume your house is still okay. Yeah, everything's good. Um, you know, about an hour south of here, everything was not good. So yeah. um, definitely utilize some resources to help people there out a little bit on my list. And uh, 
through the Florida Disaster Fund and all that. So I um, hope everybody down there is doing okay. But, you know, we tried to help as best as we could. So so let's talk a little bit about that. What What is the value for you of, of having the ability to, to make a contribution to, to give back? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things um, that a lot of people talk about. And like, obviously donating, it's like one of those things that you're supposed to do at some point because it's a good thing. And then when you do it, it makes you feel good, of course. But uh, when it hits really close to your home, whether it's like physically close to your home or like somebody you know or a cause that you believe in, that's when it actually like clicks in your head and you're like, you know what? Like I actually feel terrible for somebody else who just shouldn't be going through this situation right now. So um, we just organized a campaign where we donated some of our products basically to um, to people who wanted to donate to the Florida Disaster Fund. And then we also donated um, an amount at, at an event that I was doing. So I basically matched um, what some of my attendees had donated. And then we also, um, there was a guy we know who just so, so passionate about just like helping. He literally flew down here from, I don't even remember where it was, but he rented a boat and he was like running supplies to this island that was off of uh, Fort Myers um, because there was a couple of barrier islands and the bridges got destroyed. So uh, we helped him out. And then Julia actually had some family down there as well. Um, and their house sustained some damage. So we wanted to make sure that we took care of them too. And we ran like another campaign for that. So, um, and yeah, it, it feels good to help, but it's also, it's just kind of like a wake up call when it's really close to you. And at the same time, you get to learn a lot about people and you get to try new things. And it's like, it even, it even helps your business because you get to experiment and play with things and see what gets people to raise the most money. So Nice. Um, yeah, it's just you really have to find something that's close to home. Nice. All right, Troy, typically we end each episode with our guests sharing their words of wisdom. And so our entrepreneurial audience for the last 45 minutes has heard your great story and, and the things about your journey that have impacted you as an entrepreneur. And you want to leave them with Troy's words of wisdom. What would you share? Yeah, so I will... Uh, leave them with Metallica's words of wisdom. So that's another thing that I'm very passionate about and I've seen them 18 times. Wow. They have a song uh, with lyrics uh, that it's from The Struggle Within and it says, advantages are taken, not handed out. And ever since I heard that, it really stuck with me. So it's like, whatever you wanna do, just know that like, hey, the advantage is not gonna fall in your lap. You gotta go take advantage of whatever situation is in front of you. Um, whether it looks good or whether it looks bad, you got to find a way through it. So that's what I would say. Fantastic. Troy, thank you so much for sharing today. What a fantastic conversation. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure my audience has benefited greatly from what you've shared. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, and if anybody's interested in email, my site is faqemail.com. Thank you for tuning in to this episode brought to you by the power of intentional decisions that lead to massive action. Those aren't just buzzwords. They're qualities that can help you take control of your life and build a successful business. To support you on this journey, we're offering you our most popular survey to help you establish a baseline. Visit enjoybizlife.com to check it out and take the first steps towards changing your life and business. We often make things more complicated than they need to be, losing sight of what's truly important. This tool will help you refocus on what matters most so that you can start doing the things you've always wanted to do, like spending quality time with loved ones. And if you enjoyed this episode, please show us some love by liking, subscribing, or leaving a review. But most importantly, share it with someone who needs to hear it. In our next episode, Gwyn Wansbro and Robert talk about developing the skill of facilitation and the dynamics of online facilitation. Quinn is an expert trainer and helps others understand the difference between facilitation and teaching. These are skills that can be learned and the foundation is curiosity.